Welcome to the first episode of the 22nd series, everyone. We're going to be exploring character creation for Questlandia 2 in today's episode with fellow OneShot Network hosts of the Design Doc podcast, Hannah Schaefer and Evan Rowland. But before we get to that, we have a few announcements. First up, we are going to be at a catacomb this week. That's right, it is already here. We might be freaking out a little bit about how it snuck up on us, but it's promising to be a really good time. So if you see us, definitely say hi. I know I would love to grab a selfie with you, and I can't speak for Amelia, but I assume if you ask, there is probably a good chance to get a selfie with her as well. Also, remember our panel is scheduled for Sunday morning at 10 a.m., and we have plenty of tickets available. We would love to see you there. We are going to be creating some characters and a world together uh, with the audience through some random tables and some wonderful ideas. So uh, come participate or just enjoy the show. We would love to see you there. I already said that. Finally, we have it on good authority that Questlandia 2 might be available on itch.io very soon, if not there already. Check the show notes for a direct link if you're interested after hearing this series. If it is available, it will be in the show notes. If it is not, then you might have to wait a little bit and we will post about it as soon as it is. That's all for announcements today. We can't wait for you to hear this amazing series. So let's get on with the show. Enjoy. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan, and this episode, my co-host Amelia and I are thrilled to welcome Hannah Schaefer and Evan Rowland, designers of Questlandia and Questlandia 2, a collaborative fantasy world-building game. Welcome to Character Creation Cast. We're excited that you're both here. Hi. Hey, thanks for having us. So let's start by introducing you to our audience. Uh, Hannah, can you tell us a bit more about yourself and any projects that you're currently involved in? Yeah, I am Hannah Schaefer. I'm part of Make Big Things with Evan. Uh, we are a three-person game design co-op, uh, also with our coworker Brian Van Slyke. Uh, we make board games and role-playing games. You might be familiar with Questlandia. Uh, I've worked on Damn the Man, Save the Music, which is a role-playing game about a bunch of teenagers in the 90s trying to save their indie record store from collapse. Um, I worked with Evan on his game, Noirlandia. Um, and most recently, we all, as a cooperative, made our first board game, Good Dog, Bad Zombie, which is about dogs saving <laughs> humans from the zombie apocalypse. And it's very sweet. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a little bit about me. And what about you, Evan? Um, I'm also a part of Make Big Things, as was given away. Uh, <laughs> Ruined it. Oh, no. We've done all those old things. We're currently working on a sequel to Questlandia, and we're working on another role-playing game uh, called Starship Ultralux, which is a futuristic space cruise that we can't get off of after it's a million years off course. Hmm. So keeping busy... <laughs> with the role-playing games and outside of make big things i make a lot of board games that i bring to publishers and try to you know get them to keep it <laughs> and i work on a couple video games Ooh. about friendly goblins and sad mice very nice all right well let's go ahead and get into this uh we will start by discussing what this game is all about 
What's in a game? All right. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the settings, both for Questlandia and Questlandia 2? Yeah. So Questlandia was our first role-playing game that we made in 2014. And I think at the time we were thinking a lot about uh, worlds falling apart. Um, so Questlandia is a game about people trying to take on a big or small personal goal while their society changes rapidly around them. So it can be something as small as like, I really just want to find saffron for this loaf of bread. Like I want to find this special ingredient um, in my cupboard and I can't find it. Or something as big as like, I want to overthrow the king and be a part of the uh, proletariat revolution. Um, and it tends to tell stories like, weird fantasy. Um, so, you know, if you think like Miyazaki or never ending story, kind of this environmentalist leaning, um, fantasy with slug Kings and, you know, weird multi-limbed fairies and stuff. That is Questlandia one. Nice. Um, Evan, do you want to talk <laughs> about Questlandia two? Yeah. So Questlandia one had a habit of making really interesting fantasy worlds. It has a collaborative world building element that did a good job getting everybody at the table excited about the settings that they made and then it played out in a one shot so in a single evening uh it all fell apart you told the epilogue and you were done and often it felt like these worlds deserved more attention than the game was giving them mm -hmm. uh it was hard not to feel attached to the cool settings that everybody just built out of mm -hmm. nothing so the goal with Questlandia 2 was to create a system where you could uh, have the best of both worlds. I don't want to, I really didn't want that to be any kind of pun. Uh, <laughs> um, where you can create weird fantasy worlds to explore. You can spend a long time in them, or you can have a short trip through a car accident of a kingdom. Uh, and you can follow the people who are traveling between the worlds and are learning from the different places they explore. What sorts of things do we need to play this game? Like what kind of dice? Are there other additional tools that we need? Well, uh, <laughs> Questlandia 1 and Questlandia 2 would sort of require different answers. Um, I, I'm going to just jump straight into Questlandia 2. Um, Questlandia 1, you need mm -hmm. like a, a deck of cards and a bunch of six-sided dice and some tokens. Um, Questlandia 2, that question is still totally up in the air. Uh, <laughs> so uh, one thing that I should mention is that part of making Questlandia 2 is that we have been redesigning the game on a podcast called Design Doc. So we're essentially mm -hmm. redesigning it live from week to week, where every week we work on a new part of the game and sort of bring the audience along with us in the design. So if we, you know, make a design change in a version and everybody reacts really well to it, it sort of shapes our relationship to the game moving forward. So uh, Questlandia 2 has taken a pretty big arc of like, this game is going to be unfolding maps that ship in sealed envelopes. It's going to be, I don't know, Evan, can you think of any of the, some of the weirder things? There have been so many. Well, in the very beginning, we were very dedicated to the idea of having little journals like the mist books from the video game mm -hmm. that describe the different worlds you're in and keep your your discoveries all organized and that got ditched fairly early on because there's a problem with journals which is that they have a certain number of pages in them oh yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and you feel bad if you run out and you feel bad if you don't use them up um so then we were looking at binders decks of cards uh, unfolding maps, and uh, <laughs> I don't know where we're at. <laughs> <laughs> I think the only thing I think that has been a constant is that the game will likely have um, a custom dice mm. with little symbols on them because they're pretty 
<laughs> that's, mm -hmm. I think that's the only thing that's been a constant from version to version so far. So at least the version that we're going to do today, we will play with the symbol dice. But uh, who knows? It's like maybe eventually the game will just be a gift basket of fruit leather that... <laughs> <laughs> so that it's like this is a really unwritten future here. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of fun because we've you know we cover a lot of games like right before they go to Kickstarters or you know in some cases games that have been around for a really long time. Um, and so this is kind of fun to to cover one that's still kind of being shaped and changed and to sort of see like you know like what some of your sticking points are too and like what things you know you're you're very sure about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope I that enjoyment sticks. <laughs> we'll see by the end of the... No, I'm just kidding. Um, I do want to ask, like, I mean, those are all, like, sort of interesting and, like, specific ways of doing things. You know, like, a lot of games are just, like, the difference is how big are the dice you're using? You know, how many sides do they have? Um, is there a reason that you wanted to go with, like, journals or maps or playing cards or any of those things over just, like, d6s or d20s or something like that um and this is going to sound kind of weird but in some ways it's to increase the accessibility of the game which i know sounds totally strange when we're talking about like unfolding maps and special dice that you need um but <laughs> like part of the reason that remaking this game has taken so long is that we our goal is to eventually make it a game that somebody who has never even heard of a role-playing game can step into and can feel really guided by. So we're trying to find like the exact mix of components for uh, that the, the, can like hit that sweet spot between a person who's been playing role-playing games for years and a person who's like, I know board games and this looks a little bit like a board game. Um, mm -hmm. We want it to be potentially something that's like, you know, really easy to take on a plane. We've also like been playing the game recently while going for walks and seeing like how much we can really limit mm -hmm. the components. So um, I think the hope ultimately is that, you know, it can be a game that comes in this little box where the components feel really accessible, but that also there could be some sort of print and play version um, that does make it really easy to translate it to components you might have at home. Very cool. That's actually super interesting considering what we're going to do for like the end of the month because we do our like our character evolution cast ones that are like about playing the games then too. Um, and we are planning on recording with one of my siblings about mm -hmm. like introducing new people oh, to role playing cool. games like, yeah. who haven't played before because um, they have not like they've been wanting to and have been asking me to run things. And um, I've done like one or two, but they haven't really played before. So I'm always like looking at games like, is this something that I can explain to the rest of my yeah. family? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that'll be fun. That's awesome. So you got rid of the the little the little dangly thing. I remember you talking <laughs> the about plum that. Bob? <laughs> yes. I mean, the plum, you know, the plum Bob lives on in spirit. <laughs> <laughs> We, I just thought that was so interesting when I heard that episode. Yeah. Like, oh I my mean, goodness. the heart of the plumb bob is, can you have a element in your game, an object that is so unusual and borderline mystical that it helps bring you into the setting? Mm -hmm. That literally mm. by using this, you feel like you're more involved. And I think the original Dungeons and Dragons did this with multi-sided dice, mm -hmm. which it's not like a requirement to use D20s to make that system work, but it was written with them. And when you roll them, it has an arcane feeling. You're using strange, iconic, platonic songs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Reality change because of it. Um, and what we've ended up with at this point, that's the closest to that, I think is our symbol chart. Yeah, which is a, it's inspired by the alethiometer in the uh, his mark his dark materials series. Mm. Um, it is a web of symbols or a compass rose of symbols, uh, where the meaning of these various symbols are interpreted by the players as we go, which is a way to both tie the worlds together because it's familiar symbols. And let them be wildly divergent because the symbols mean whatever we want them to mean in the context of the world we're in. Mm -hmm. I like it. It's it's a uh, for the the people in the audio only 
portion of the podcast, the listeners, um, it's it's kind of a chart that has like six symbols on the inside, and then each of those has six symbols attached to it. And it creates this this cool uh, like multi circle pattern of sorts that's uh, really interesting. It's just just a bunch of cool symbols. So thirty six symbols on the outside, right? That's right. Yeah, I like that a lot. And so then it's open for people to kind of like interpret what those things mean in relation to the story that you're telling. Is that? That's right. Exactly. Oh, that's so good. Yeah, that's I love. Good. I love. I'm a sucker for things like that. Though. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> like, like Ryan and I are always like, "Oh, cool. We don't know what it means. That's amazing." <laughs> <laughs> we get like so excited about that. Like, that's true. What do you well- want it to be? Oh man. <laughs> Well, speaking of uh, stories and themes, uh, what what sort of stories and themes uh, did you mean for this game uh, to explore? Uh, Evan, do you kind of want to like divide this answer up? Sure. Do you want to do stories or? Oh, themes? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll do I'll do stories. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, when when we first had made the first version of Questlandia, the the name had been that this was not supposed to be the final name of the game. Like it was sort of a, a joke placeholder name to represent like a sweeping fantasy story with a Lord of the Rings style journey, uh, the, like something Landia. Um, and sort of by accident through playtesting in most of the games, the characters never actually went anywhere because they're <laughs> like, I think the intention was for them to eventually leave and have a journey, but the kingdom's, fell into chaos so quickly that like they rarely got started. Um, and maybe, maybe it was just where I was at my life at the, at the time where I was like, Oh, it's like a metaphor. You always just are trying to get started. Um, but <laughs> it, it came to tell these stories of, um, people sort of coming together to find community and to, you know, make the best of what was often like a really challenging or unpredictable situation. So, I feel like even in Questlandia 2, those are stories that we're trying to tell. Uh, Questlandia 2 is a little bit different because it introduces this metaplot element, which Questlandia 1 didn't have. So, you know, in Questlandia 1, like Evan said, it was a one shot. You play this weird kingdom, you watch it fall, and you're done. In Questlandia 2, you are ghosts who are sort of floating between worlds, and you are watching people's lives unfold and then you're sort of floating to the next place uh i don't really know exactly what that is a metaphor for yet but (laughs) it's still kind of telling these stories of you know people trying to really come together in these sort of harrowing moments of challenge and change so how about those themes evan oh yeah (laughs) um so I mean, we're not starting with some set metaphors in play, but the ghosts, you know, an aspect of the metaphor of the ghosts is it's a metaphor for role-playing game players because they are there exploring these worlds, Ooh. having a sort of dual role of both creating the worlds and experiencing them, influencing them, but also just witnessing them and watching them. And the attitudes of the different ghosts that are traveling to these worlds uh, reflect different motivations and themes that people might want to get out of this game. So I don't want to jump ahead. Obviously, we're going to be doing this for real. But part of the game is choosing what archetype of ghost you're going to play as. And that choice is about what kind of theme and uh, story you want to see in the worlds that we're going to. And, well, soon we'll get to a lot of examples of that. That's so interesting that you've, you've kind of pulled the camera back from people playing characters at a table to people playing people playing characters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. It's been a real balance to not get too uh, annoyingly meta- that's really cool though that's like fascinating to me because i don't this is a part of game design that i just don't like i don't know if my brain just doesn't work in that way or like but 
people say things like, they're like, oh, this game does this. And I'm like, how did you even think that that was a thing that you could do or would want to do or (laughs) then did? Like, I don't understand. (laughs) Like, I want to know where these ideas come from because I'm always just like, oh, I didn't even consider that. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I think... Sometimes when I'm sitting down as a player at a table, I have this moment where I sort of, you know, it's almost like an out-of-body experience where I'm like, what is a role-playing game? Um, And I am totally, like, not going to be the one to come up with the definitive answer to that question. And I don't think it has a definitive answer, but it's really a strange experience of, like, embodying this person who is you but not you for, you know, sometimes many hours or, like, even years of your life if you're playing a campaign game at a time and mm-hmm. it's weird. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I guess the idea comes from that sort of obsessive fascination with like, what is this thing that we're doing? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I do think role-playing games have an ability to like um, sort of teach empathy in a way that a lot of other media doesn't because it's one of the few times where you're like, I'm just going to be someone else for a while and to like, look through someone else's eyes and see what it is to, like, interact with the world in different ways. And that part is always fascinating to me, too, of, like, how we just, like, decide to be someone else for a while. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I think it, you know, it doubles back, too. It it, it can create a kind of self-awareness that we are all playing roles. Mm -hmm. uh, And we are, you know, playing our favorite character from day to day. (laughs) I mean, I would hope so. (laughs) It's one you've chosen to some extent. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's mind expanding to play something else and to appreciate different views. Um, I think there's something beautiful about it. The group of people uh, exploring a world as different people, all sort of sharing their imaginations with each other. And, you know, that beauty is maybe in a role-playing game by default, but we kind of just want to draw it right into the game rules anyway, where now you're mm-hmm. beautiful ghosts. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and I think that's a thing that different game systems do. Um, and that's, you know, like part of that question about themes and stories is that like lots of role playing games do lots of things. But I think the reason that we use different systems and different mechanics are because there's certain portions of that experience that we want to highlight. And, you know, like, different games sort of tug on different parts of that or like bring certain things forward. Totally. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the history of this game. Obviously Questlandia 2 is still a work in progress. Um, But as far as like Questlandia 1, I want to start with why, why did you want to make this game? Like where did this come from? Evan, you want to take that one? I feel like I've sort of talked a little bit about some of what, where it came from for me. So maybe you have some thoughts. Yeah, there's a there's a distant inspiration, which is the 2008 housing crash. <laughs> and, <laughs> and a um, growing recognition at that point in our lives about the instability of the society that we lived in. And that question of, does that have to be my problem? <laughs> Do I have to deal <laughs> with my society being unstable? And that question is what all the characters in Questlandia 1 are asking themselves. Um, Oof. A very, <laughs> yeah. In a very... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just like a fun chill time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that is where the joyous, uplifting game of Questlandia was born. <laughs> um, in a very practical level... Um, Hannah and I started a community center in our town and on opening day, you know, we had a little, it's opening day event and everybody who showed up was a role-playing game designer. (laughs) Just by Uh, chance. (laughs) There's a lot of them in Western Mass, which is what we learned that day. (laughs) Strange. Um, and that was the first time we learned that role-playing games are made and not born. Uh, (laughs) we became friends with some very wonderful designers uh, and slowly got the feeling that maybe we could do this too. (laughs) Yeah. 
That's very cool. It's, uh, it was, it definitely sort of shaped, I mean, it ended up shaping the entire direction of this community center that we had started because, you know, it was like on day one, Vincent Baker and McGay Baker and Emily Care Boss and Epidiah Rad- wow. Ravichal and Joshua A.C. Newman, you know, all these people waltzed in the door and we were like, who wow. are you? You were this conclave of of power and weirdness. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted power and weirdness. <laughs> uh, yeah. And it was kind of cool, I think. I mean, Evan had played role playing games before, but I really hadn't. And so it was to kind of meet a bunch of people who made games without any context for like who these folks were and what they did was neat. So <laughs> I was a skeptic. So, how did they all like end up at your community center opening like i guess in my head when you first said that i was like oh you guys were game designers and they were like hey we'll support but like no oh. apparently not um, <laughs> how did they all end up there? i actually think it was like about as random a thing as you can imagine i think somebody had posted on like a vegan message board being like this is not a specifically vegan thing but there's this community thing happening and i I think it was a message board, like, in New York City. Like, none of this should have come together. Oh, Um, Oh my gosh. (laughs) And it was meant to be. (laughs) somehow, somehow, word spread. That's amazing. I like how people... you're looking to get your start in the industry, hit up the New York Vegan Society. (laughs) (laughs) I just, I'm fascinated by people, like... All the time, it seems like people just sort of, like, fall into game design. Like, I feel like there are very few people who are like, I'm going to grow up to be a game designer. It's just, like, it it's a, seems to be a thing that accidentally happens to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And, like, I know, I always say, that, like, that's been my experience is, like, I swear I will never be a game designer. Like, I will talk about <laughs> games. I will play games. But I think I said on another podcast at one point, I was like, that's a nerd thing for, like, nerds. I, like, I will play games. I will talk about games. I will read the games. I will not make the games. That's a bridge too far. Um, and then here I am, like, kind of maybe working on, like, two different ones. <laughs> So sorry. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you um, for your support in this difficult time. Uh, but it's like I, you have an idea and then it just like won't go away. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, like you just fall into a group of people that are doing that and then that's like your hobby now. Or I just, it feels like very few people wake up and are like, I'm going to make a game. Mm-hmm. It's just like a thing that you're like, well, I guess I got to do it yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> It is this like creative outlet that can also bring together so many different passions. I mean, if you like writing, you can make role playing games. If you like to do design, like layout design, you can make role playing games. If you're an artist, like it, it feels like it just like converges on all of these different things. So mm-hmm. uh, for me, it, it really scratched the itch of like all of this weird creative stuff that I never had a place for. And I was like, whoa. Yeah, it's a game and a book, and it does it all. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> I want to ask too, then, because because that is a thing that I love about game design is that like it it connects all of those different pieces. Um, but have you found it um easier, harder, uh, when you are collaborating with somebody else? Because I know it it changes the dynamic and like the work process and all that kind of stuff for different games. Do you find it? easier, harder, better in some places? Harder in some places, better in some places. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I mean, uh, you know, in my, in our work collaborating, like me and Evan, you know, we were like in a relationship for many years and uh, game design both brought us together and really put pressure on the seams. Um, Collaborating Mm -hmm. takes like so much (laughs) trust. Uh, And you have to really trust, like, your own voice also. I think that as a person who can be really uh, skeptical of whether I'm contributing anything, you know, sometimes, like, Evan and I would be sort of riffing on each other's ideas. And I would be like, oh, is this my idea anymore? Like, did I contribute anything to this? So it... uh, It is really great to collaborate, and it's. I think at this point, it's the way that I love most making things, and also it is like heart wrenching. (laughs) So I don't know how you (laughs) feel, Evan. Um, I agree that it's. I mean, it's. I mean, for me, it's necessary. I'm not making anything on my own. 
Um, I love collaborating, but it definitely puts special pressures on the two or three or however many of you. You know, it's less like hiking a mountain together and more like being lost in the woods together. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, You know, you want to get someplace. It's not clear where you're going. Sometimes it will be clear that you've been going the wrong way. And like, what's it going to be like with you and your friends in those moments? Uh, You'll get to find out. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I feel like that's a really good metaphor for it, too, because there's, you know, like there's always those people that are like, I'm really good at this thing. And then to have somebody else that's really good at the other thing to sort of balance that out is really nice. But then I think sometimes you're like, no, you're not seeing my vision. Yeah. You're not understanding what I'm trying to tell. And then like trying really hard to either find a better way to communicate that or to like understand that it, it's okay. And maybe maybe your vision isn't the only one. And I have a hard time with that. Yeah. <laughs> with that part of it when I collaborate on things is like, n- no, but like my thing is right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then to like give that <laughs> up and to like to hand over who- some of that. Who, who listen to me and they say, oh, you're definitely right. Like, that's really important to me. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, if I was putting together a team to collaborate, I would be less interested in making all the skill sets combine and having the cleric and the tank and everybody. <laughs> and I'd be more interested in a group that seemed able to communicate really well and honestly to each other and had good conflict resolution. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's super important. Um, and like trying to uh, collaborate with people who, like, you can still come out on the other side of that disagreement too. Um, because I think sometimes things do get heated. Because I think in creative projects, you're doing it because it's a thing you're passionate about, right? Like, you're not just like, mm, I guess, I don't know, I got some free time. Right. Um, it's just definitely not why we do game design. <laughs> um, but to have a collaboration with somebody who, like, you know, you can get really heated and really passionate and then at the end be like, we're still cool, right? Like, things are fine. Like, this is the game. We're still friends. Yeah. It's all okay at the end. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. I think that sometimes uh, people who are going into something and collaborating for the first time, that's the hardest part to get past is, like, to realize that, like, there are going to be moments of saying no. Like, that idea, like, I'm not saying my idea is the right one, but, like, this thing... Uh, this thing doesn't work for me. And that it's it's really hard to say no to your friend's creative input. And it's hard to hear that mm-hmm. yourself. Uh, or at least for me, it has been. Um, you know, because you <laughs> yeah. want to like, you, you want to deliver a soft, a soft blow, like a gentle pat that's like, no, mm-hmm. no. <laughs> but you can't do that. So uh, it's, it's really challenging. I've definitely learned a lot about myself in the process. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes yeah. you just have to kind of say no to yourself. Yeah. Like, uh, and, uh, and also, like, say somebody in your design team has a really, like, completely off-the-wall idea that seems like it probably wouldn't work, but maybe it could. You have to kind of just try it out. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the beauty of game design is, is you, can, you can try something out, and if, you, if it doesn't work... You don't need to keep it. Yeah. Right. Right. Which is why we do playtesting. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> have you have you been able to do some playtesting for Questlandia 2 yet? Or are you still early enough in the process that that hasn't, I mean, outside the two of you working on it, hasn't really? Uh, we've actually done a ton of playtesting, but it's like this game is so changeable <laughs> that, you know, every version <laughs> really ends up sort of becoming a new game. Uh, but we've we've been playtesting mm-hmm. it calmly and kind of in the background for about a year and a half. Mm-hmm. Are there any particular things that you've, like any lessons that you've taken away that have really like really changed the process? Obviously, it sounds like everything has kind of you know had some influence on it. But is there anything that's like fundamentally changed the way you looked at the game? One lesson we learned really early on, <laughs> which. Uh, hit hard was that we had our meta level characters the people who go between the worlds and we had all of our mechanics for how characters within the worlds worked but then we didn't actually have any rules about how your meta level characters do anything 
<laughs> and we ended up just stuck in a room with nobody even clear on like how do I walk out of a room? <laughs> it was no. it was like this very dramatic. We were like, okay, we're gonna run the game for the first time for our friends, and we're like, you're all ghost travelers between worlds. You're in a library. It's very mysterious, and you know we kind of set the scene, and then people were like, can I just like walk out of a room? What can I do? And we're like, okay, everybody go home now. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of those like I can't see the forest for the trees like mm-hmm. I've got I'm like okay I've got this and then everybody's like yeah but like yeah <laughs> that's amazing I feel like that's I mean and that's one of those things that that's why you play test because when you've looked at something for so long you you kind of forget that like you know all of these things that I know in my head like oh I have to translate that to everybody else yeah. too like I'm not the only person playing this game other people need to understand like what this is that I'm trying to yeah create. totally so uh, how oh go ahead so go ahead. I was gonna say so uh, how did making design doc then affect the the process of creating the game uh, I'll say one thing is that it's inspired us to keep some things that maybe we would have kind of glossed over. Uh, Like the symbol reader was something that we threw together. I think we had both been like rereading Golden Compass. We're like, "Uh, the alethiometer is cool. You know, we want to not feel totally bound by using dice in like a really familiar way in this game. Let's try symbols for random generation. Um, Also in Questlandia 1, all of the tables that were random generators tended to kind of lean towards... Uh, Middle Earth type of fantasy, you know, like you had a a high nobility, you had a messenger, you had, uh, you know, people who were peasants. And we thought that making them symbols would push the game even farther in this direction of weird fantasy. Um, I don't think we really planned on keeping the symbol reader, but we had shared it on Twitter and people just went bananas for it so <laughs> we we're like oh that's cool i guess people like this thing mm-hmm. it's been useful to have a recurring obligation around this game design project where it's like well mm-hmm. we gotta report to the public <laughs> <laughs> yeah that level of accountability yeah. and you know did we make progress on the game mm-hmm. and what actual lessons did we learn from it and uh not just that, how are the lessons that we learned about this specific game useful for game design in general? Mm-hmm. If at all possible, can it be generalized? Um, one nice effect of that has been when we turn to our other projects that aren't Questlandia 2, we actually have a whole bunch of new strategies and sort of tool sets for designing those games that have worked, which is cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I feel really grateful for having this podcast and accountability and the the pressure of, you know, bringing thought to every aspect of the design and being able to defend the decisions of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think having some of that accountability is really, really important because I've had so many creative projects that kind of stall out because you're just like, I don't quite know where to go and like nobody's checking up on me so like i'll come back to it and then you don't um that's the thing that i've loved about like even just about podcasting like with my other podcast too it's like oh this is an excuse like my friend and i now have to hang out um because we have to make this podcast every you know we have to put this out every two weeks and so it's like okay well now every week we have to make time to work on this thing Mm -hmm. and so it's like Now, through podcasting, I have scheduled friend time, which is great. (laughs) Um, But I think sometimes you need to have that level of, like, accountability or scheduling or something like that just to, like, hold yourself to that standard. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I I really like the the kind of the transparency that you have in the podcast of the design process and, and how even in some episodes it's, like, you're starting to talk about something and then you can kind of almost see the light bulbs show up. As you're talking, and then you're like, okay, well, now we're down this path, and now this thing has completely changed. So it's a really interesting experience as a designer listening to that. I've really enjoyed those moments. Uh, it's like the most fun thing at all is going into the podcast, starting a recording, and having no idea what kind of game will end up at the other end. Yeah. And I feel like that's cool to have it recorded for posterity, too, to be like, 
oh, I can watch this process happen. Because I think it does happen in a lot of creative projects where you sit down and you're like, I don't know where we're going with this. And then, you know, like it sort of snowballs and you have this idea that gets bigger and bigger. And then, you know, like you end up with something at the end, but it's really cool that you guys can go back and look at it and, you know, see how it all kind of developed. And then to know too, because it's recorded, like you can see the progress over time to know that, like, I think we all have those days where it's like, I'm, I'm getting nowhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and so to be able to have that to look back on and be like, oh, this is where we started. Like, we've definitely done a lot, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, in that spirit, I've because I don't plan on re-listening to Design Doc because I hate having to listen to my own voice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when I'm editing, I'm like, <laughs> um, but I've been trying to get better at like even just version control where rather than overwriting files, even if I know I'm never going to use this version of the game again, that I save it as like version 1.2 and being able to open up those PDFs and see this arc of development where I'm like, okay, we're, we're building out this game at like turtle pace, but it, it is moving forward and there are changes. Mm -hmm. So Before we actually dive into character creation and uh, world creation for Questlandia 2, um, are there any basic terms and concepts that we need to understand? We have some brand new terms. Yeah. (laughs) All right. I'm ready. You are the first spicy terms of um, (laughs) the spooky ghost edition of Questlandia 2. (laughs) Uh, Because they were not always ghosts. No. But. we don't have to get into that. In fact, we've all forgotten our pasts. Ghosts. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so as a ghost, you are a denizen of one of the many worlds uh, of this universe of worlds. And now without memories, you're traveling between them. The way you travel between them is through ghost passages. And this is a sort of tunnel between worlds where you have a very limited amount of control of what world you end up in. And they're not always available. If you spend enough time in a world, you might have the opportunity to go through another ghost passage that opens up. And at that point in play, you would have a choice of whether to remain in the world or to seek greener pastures (laughs) in some place completely new. Altogether, uh, we are a concord, which is a group of spirits that have agreed to journey together Mm. and support each other in their search for their own memories and their own meanings in the worlds that we go to. So to recap, ghost, ghost passage, concord. Any other really good terms, Hannah? (laughs) I think that a lot of things will end up either being explained during play or will be sort of self-evident. Like the symbol reader is a, the symbol reader. <laughs> mm-hmm. it's this, it, it has symbols. It a, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, uh, and any other terms also may be in flux. You know, like the mechanics of the game are just like a real light touch right now. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Are we ready to get into it? Yeah. Yes. All right. So. Let's make cool. some people. Let's make some Our people. Ghosts. Let's make some people. Well, are ghosts people, Ryan? Ghosts are people. Okay. As we have established, okay. any sentient creature is a person. Okay. This is Ryan has strong opinions about what I, is. Oh, people. I like it. <laughs> this comes up in Queenslandia <laughs> all the time. <laughs> all right. So, where do we start in this process? What's the first thing we have to do to make some characters? Um. So the first thing that we're doing to create characters in Questlandia Two is creating the universe. All right. Ooh, fun. <laughs> this is Ryan's First favorite we part. we must create the universe. <laughs> so, the game picks up as we're traveling through a ghost passage on our way to a new world. And there are two places that are going to become possibilities for us to travel to. All we can tell about those two places to begin with is what symbol represents them. So the first thing we're going to do is roll the symbol die twice to get to one of the outer symbols on our symbol reader. Nice. All right. I'm happy to handle the rolling and other people can interpret the symbols. All right. So uh, before we roll, do the um, descriptions on the inside of the symbol chart 
mean anything uh, in this partic particular portion, or are we just paying attention to the outside symbols that we roll? For this moment, it's just the outside symbols. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Those definitions will come into play more later. From each of the outer symbols that we're going to get, we're going to get two of them, um, we'll have you interpret them and give them basically a title. That'll be the title of the world that we can go to. Ooh. Um, and there's no right or wrong answers. Your interpretation can be super literal. It doesn't have to be clever, but it can also be clever. <laughs> it's all good. No, I don't I like things where there's not a right or wrong answer. <laughs> like, I need to know, am I doing it correctly? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. Uh, I don't know. Just imagine somebody saying yes to every question. That goes through your <laughs> okay. Head. Um, so I'll roll the die. I will not describe the symbol, though, because I, you know, want to leave that interpretation mm -hmm. up to you all. Um, but I will ask somebody to interpret the symbol. Um, awesome. All right. So let me roll for the inner symbol first. Okay. I got a hand. All okay. right. So we are heading down the path of the hand symbol. And for the second symbol, I rolled a moon. So Ooh. if you follow the hand and the moon... Ryan, do you want to say what you see? And that will be the title of one possible world that we visit. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. So, um, all right. I, I don't want to just have the title be Eyeball, right? Oh, it could because be. It, but that's it up could to be. you. It, could, it, it is up to me. But uh, for the, the people at home, it, it looks like an eyeball. With uh, with like a half closed eyelid on it, maybe some uh, some wrinkle spots uh, around it to indicate that it is part of a face, which is very interesting. Um, but I'm going to say Iris. Mm. Ooh. Kingdom of Iris. Cool. Cool. Because that sounds. That cool. does sound pretty cool. All right, so we have Iris as one possible world. I'm going to roll again. It is again a hand for the uh -oh. first path. Let's see what the second one is. And the second one is a skull. Ooh. So, Amelia. Yes, that's that's very Amelia. Um, <laughs> hmm. Oh, gosh. What do we call this, though? What does it look like to you? Let's start there. Well, it's... Okay, literal interpretation, audio medium for our audience. <laughs> um, it is uh, scales. Cool. So that to me is like justice, order. Uh, but those aren't good names for things. I mean, they could be. They could be. People at home. No People wrong at home. If you want to do that, that's fine. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of like synonyms for this. But also, we can. Um, as a group, that's fine. If anyone else has ideas, I mean, weight, balance. Yeah, my first thought was balance. Balance. Yeah. So I feel like mm. to me, it's like something like orderly and codified. Mm. If you could pick one word to sort of sum up the world, mm -hmm. my vocabulary is failing me. I kind of like out codified. Of codified yeah. as a world name is is kind of interesting yeah. to me. And just to be clear, this isn't necessarily the name that the people of this world have for their world. Okay, that it? makes me feel less stressed about mm. it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. It's, we will just say codified. <laughs> codified. Cool. So now, as a whole group, we need to make the decision. We can control if we're going to pop out of this passage into Kingdom Codified or Kingdom Iris. Mm. Ooh. Does anybody feel a leaning? And so literally at this point, this is all we are establishing about this, right? Like we, mm -hmm. uh -huh. okay, oh, we can't, we, we have to like, <sighs> we don't know anything about them before we have to decide. I know. We have to dive in. It's, it's almost yeah. like we're, we're playing the game as these ghosts. We right are. Now. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> Gasp. Don't, don't bring your seriousness. Into <laughs> uh, I, I want to go with Iris. I kind of want to go with Iris as well. Okay. Let's do it. All right. Let's go with Iris. All right. So we emerge into the kingdom of Iris. And the first thing we're going to find out about this world, 
about these people is their ambition. This is what the society is striving towards. And it's going to be another role and interpret, this time one of the six internal symbols. So Hannah, do you want to roll? Yeah, so I'm just rolling once. Mm -hmm. All right, I rolled, and it is our favorite symbol, a hand. Oh, boy. So now we can look at those uh, extra, what's the word? We can look at those suggested interpretations Mm -hmm. underneath the hand symbol, which are skill, labor, and creation. So its ambition is along those lines. Hannah, do you want to take a stab at what might be the ambition of these people? Sure. I can propose something and see what people think. Uh, I like the idea, when I think of Iris, I kind of think of like close inspection or like, you know, really looking something over. Uh, So I feel like maybe their ambition is somehow connected to like, uh, I don't know, like the careful consideration of a craft that a lot of people do. Does is that something that resonates with people or yeah. like the perfection of a craft? So I think yeah, too, I mean, like I was gonna say along with like the labor and skill part of it, I think of like building mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. And so to me, we, it would be like very like intricate architecture. Mm. Do we want to go like super, super meta? Uh, you tell me. Say more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like wh- the, uh, the iris and the eyes are the gateway to the soul. What if they're creating people? Ooh. Which is what we're doing right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which is what we're doing. Oh, I see. <laughs> so I see where you're going with this. They are. They want to perfect the craft of creating people. Yes. A special industry in this. Oh, world. that's so spooky. Yes, I like it. <laughs> I'm, I'm into it. I like it because I feel like Let's it can go spooky it. or go golem or like go in all these different mm-hmm. possible yeah. directions. All right. Mm-hmm. Great. Great. At this point, we are going to choose our ghosts. So. We have, is it five right now? One, two, three, four, five. There's a PDF that's been distributed. This is five different ghost archetypes. Um, You can imagine these printed out, laid out on the table. (laughs) And we're going to choose the one that uh, speaks to you as the kind of um, aspects of this world that you want to learn about and explore and expand on the most. So it looks like we have the investigator, the mischief maker, the adventurer, the gardener, and the builder. Interesting. So I'll start by asking if there's anything that immediately speaks to anybody or immediately doesn't. I don't think I I want the, uh, I don't think I want the mischief maker. I'll take the mischief maker then. (laughs) Ryan. (laughs) (laughs) I've got a brand and I'm sticking to it. I think I would like the investigator. Mm. Cool. Cool. So the mischief maker, the investigator. Mm. I'll go with uh, between the gardener and the builder. I'm thinking probably the builder. All right. Then I'll snag the gardener. Ooh. All right. So on your sheets, you have a few things to look over. Um, that will give you a sense of the kind of things you're going to be doing. Uh, One of those, (laughs) which is something you're not going to be doing in this particular playtest, is calling for a scene. But this is one of the most major powers that you have as a ghost. You can create a moment in this world that we are going to follow. You can uh, talk about what characters will be there and what they'll be doing. And for every ghost the kinds of scenes that you call for, the ways that they're set up, what can happen in them, and what happens as a result of them is all different. So just for example, as the gardener, I can have a scene about a special plant, which is a uh, using a particular plant of this world to cause a sort of targeted effect or impact mm. on characters of the story. There's a shared ritual where people are coming together and through a ritual, uh, changing their relationship to each other or learning new information. And it can heal or it can harm a time where nature damages or restores a part of the society. That's sort of the aspect that that's a big part of the framework that I'm using Mm -hmm. to understand this setting. Very cool. So for 
looking over those. No, right no, ahead. continue, Evan. I like uh, not having to act as GM. It's nice. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing that you'll definitely want to glance over are the touchstones for your character. These are basically plot hooks that you can insert into a world. Only one per world. And it sets up a problem or a mystery or a goal that you want to see answered over the course of our stay in this world. Mm. And by answering that or bringing closure to that, uh, that hook that you've introduced into the world, you learn something about your past, who you were before you became a ghost. Things like what your name was or how you ended up joining this concord. For the gardener, um, I can plant a tree in the setting. And if I learn who will sit in the shade of this tree, I unlock a memory. I can also uh, introduce a plant that is being sought by the people of this world. And if we learn how it changes the people, then I've unlocked my memory. And finally, I can create a place that is lifeless and barren. And if nature reclaims it, I gain a memory. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you've looked over those, then take a look at the left side of your sheet. You're going to just choose an appearance and a manner for your particular ghost. So in terms of character creation of your ghost at this moment, that's <laughs> it. You're going to choose your appearance and your manner. Hmm. Character creation um, done. <laughs> All right, we did it. <laughs> Go team. <laughs> hey. We're really going to get stuck. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. All right, so for the investigator, um, for my appearance, I'm going to pick upright and dapper. Mm -hmm. And for my manner, uh, I don't know if I want to go to the point or dangerously curious. I'm going to go with dangerously curious because that's how I like to play in games. Yeah. I always tell anybody who's running a game, I'm like, if you put a thing in front of me, I will go touch it <laughs> just to see what happens because I need to know. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I've, I really like that combination, though. Yeah. Like dapper and just like, I got to touch know. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, I hope it doesn't get on me. <laughs> yeah. I must stick with you. Yes. <laughs> and for myself, for the builder... Um, for my appearance, um, I think I'm going to go with constructed from many pieces. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, that's, that sounded really interesting. Uh, my other options were large and solid or a bug with a hard hat. <laughs> <laughs> I love how different these are. Uh-huh. I wanted to ask about that, too, because one of my choices is also a handsome red fox. And I was like, that's cool. I don't want to be a fox. And then I was like, wait, but what does that mean? And then I was like, the answer is probably, it's up to you. And I was like, I don't want to think about that. <laughs> I think it's also just like um, sort of to, you know, inspire people to think about their ghosts as not necessarily human. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, and then the manner, uh, I chose full of enthusiasm. Uh, but other did. options were always always tinkering and focused on the plan were the other options I had. Yeah, I, full of enthusiasm is kind of like super on brand. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. I so I wrote these in this morning. That there was no rushing. Um, some of them were written in this morning, <laughs> and I literally wrote in full of enthusiasm, thinking of you, Ryan. So Aww. I am glad. <laughs> I'm glad that it's fallen to uh, the right place. <laughs> That's really hilarious that I chose the builder. Yeah, right? that's that's great. That makes me yeah. so happy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> How many times have you gotten the answer that this part of character creation was created specifically to create you? I know, right? <laughs> that's not meta at all. <laughs> uh, We're on so many levels right now. Yeah. Oh, man. So inception. I am going to be the mischief maker for my appearance. I'm going to choose large, furry, and scruffy. And for Amazing. my manner, I'm going to say a happy menace. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so good. Um, as the gardener, 
I've chosen that my appearance is a small garden snake. Nice. And my manner is rough-edged and loving. Hmm. So, a affectionate, if crass, <laughs> snake. I like it. It's very good. Nature. Cool. Well, we just made so, people. We made people. We did it. <laughs> We've made our people. Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Session Zero. Session Zero is a discussion podcast that seeks to explore the psychology of role-playing. Each episode will feature RP concepts, stories, and tropes viewed through the lens of psychology by clinical psychologist Porter Green and industrial organizational psychologist Steve Discount. Join us on the couch for the next session.